Good morning from Athens, Greece. It is around 8.45 here on this Wednesday morning. Let's talk about the news and let's discuss a uh, Russian news uh, publication which talks about um, a potential deal and a potential ceasefire between Ukraine and Russia. Let's discuss the rehabilitation and the reemergence of Angela Merkel on the world stage. Let's also talk about how NATO is, uh, is saying that Finland and Sweden have uh, all the right to have nuclear weapons on their territory. And let's also talk about how Ukraine is lashing out at Israel now, <laughs> picking a fight with Israel. And uh, we'll also do a cloud world as well, which is a good one, which uh, is connected to Boris Johnson, this clown world. So you had a news article in, uh, in the Russian media from Izvestia, and uh, this is causing quite a stir because Izvestia is making claims that they have high-level sources in the Kremlin who have uh, told them that back in March, when negotiations were taking place between Ukraine and Russia in Turkey, that uh, the Kremlin had actually agreed to a deal. They had uh, come to an agreement for a ceasefire, and that ceasefire pretty much went along the lines of the, uh, the Minsk Accords, with one exception, and that was that uh, Ukraine recognized, Kiev would recognize that uh, Donetsk and Lugansk, the Donbass, were now um, out of play. They were not uh, going to be returned back to Ukraine. So the basic agreement was that uh, Crimea was off the table, Donetsk and Lugansk would also be off the table and recognized as uh, independent republics or as part of the, the Russian Federation. And uh, then you would have all kinds of security guarantees and uh, guarantor states and Ukraine would uh, be a neutral country. And that was pretty much the framework of the agreement back in March that uh, the Russian government, from what these sources at Izvestia are, uh, are saying, uh, agreed to. And um, what spoiled it was uh, Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson came in last minute and he uh, called up Elensky and he told him to, uh, to ditch the deal, to not agree to it. And uh, of course he made promises of weapons and money and all kinds of uh, gifts. And I'm also sure that Boris Johnson um, made various threats as well to uh, Elensky and his, uh, his crew of, of actors producers, directors, and script writers. And uh, Alensky pulled out. He pulled out of, of the agreement. But uh, that's not the only thing that this article and these sources claim. They also claim that uh, there is some sort of agreement being worked out or being negotiated. There's definitely dialogue that we know. We know that Russia and Ukraine are, are constantly um, in, in dialogue to figure out uh, a solution. But uh, there are talks that a new deal may be in the works, which would see Ukraine as, uh, as a neutral state. It would have security guarantees and guarantor states, but pretty much what you see right now on the map is pretty much what Ukraine would look like. In other words, it would be frozen with... Uh, with the territorial gains of the Russian Federation, as is Zaporozhye, Kherson, all that area would now be off the table. So you would have Crimea, the Donbas, and Zaporozhye and Kherson either becoming uh, independent republics or becoming part of the Russian Federation. And Ukraine, as you see it now, would be the Ukraine that is agreed upon in this ceasefire. Now, this has a lot of people talking, especially hardliners and uh, hardliners in the Kremlin and, and many people in Russia who believe that at a minimum, any type of uh, peace agreement or any type of end or pause or end in the conflict should uh, include Odessa to be returned to, uh, to Russia. Of course, Odessa right now is not, uh, is not being contested. I mean, the, the Russian military hasn't made any types of uh, advances towards Odessa. But obviously, there are a lot of hardliners and a lot of people in Russia who want to see the Russian military make a move on Odessa 
and at a minimum not come to to an agreement or not pause the special military operation until Odessa is under the control of uh, of the Russian Federation. So this has a lot of people talking, and uh, there are some people who are upset. So I'm sure there are a lot of people who are uh, saying this would be a good thing because it would put an end to the special military operation, but it's definitely caught the attention of a lot of people because of the fact that uh, Odessa is not being uh, discussed. And obviously, Odessa is, is a city and an area which carries a lot of significance for the, uh, for the Russian um, Federation, history, culture, etc. But um, Dmitry Peskov, the Kremlin spokesperson, actually sounded off about this uh, Izvestia article and uh, he said, none of it is true. Peskov actually said that uh, Zaporozhye and Kherson are not being discussed. Now, what Peskov meant by that, I'm not quite sure. That's all he kind of uh, hints at, that Zaporozhye and Kherson are not being discussed in any types of, uh, of negotiations. And um, I don't know if he means that if there is some sort of agreement, Kherson and Zaporozhye are not going to be included in uh, as Ukraine territory, or if he means that Zaporozhye and Kherson are uh, not going to be included as Russian uh, territory if there is a deal that, uh, that gets worked out. So this article has definitely caught the attention of a lot of people, and uh, there are a lot of people talking about it. But... Uh, we, we don't know. We don't know if it's true or not true. We don't know who these sources are. I have to say that when I hear, you know, the Russian media say that they have anonymous sources in the Russian government, I, I take pause in much the same way when I hear that coming from uh, the New York Times or the Washington Post in the United States as well. So anyway, let's let's leave that there. I just think I think it was uh, an interesting article and um, it has a lot of uh, people talking. So now let's move on to, let's talk about Angela Merkel. And Angela Merkel, she has resurfaced. She's re, re-emerged. And uh, she's given quite a, quite a few media, um, media appearances. She's making a lot of media appearances. And this time she was being interviewed at some conference. I forgot the name of the conference, it's not important. But uh, it, during the conference, the, uh, the interviewer asked her about the fact that it was Merkel that was one of the, the European leaders who did not want Ukraine to enter NATO, like back in 2007, 2008. And, uh, and Merkel was also one of the leaders involved in the, uh, the signing of the Minsk Accords as well. And uh, Merkel said that, Number one, Ukraine was, back then in 2007, 2008, Ukraine was run by a bunch of oligarchs and it was corrupt. And so there was no way that Ukraine was going to be able to, uh, to enter NATO as a corrupt oligarch state. Not that anything has really changed in, uh, in the last eight years with regards to Ukraine, but that was her, uh, her reply to that question. And with regards to the Minsk Accords, Angela Merkel hinted at the fact that uh, because the Minsk Accords weren't implemented by Ukraine, but were still um, kind of floating around. In other words, you had these accords and the Russians were pressing Ukraine, Germany, and France to, uh, to implement the Minsk Accords because France and Germany were signatories to that agreement. And uh, they were dragging their heels. Merkel hinted at the fact that these eight years, the eight years of, uh, of heel dragging <laughs> actually gave Ukraine time to prepare its, uh, its military and to prepare its defenses. I mean, that was pretty much the vibe, the hint of, uh, of her reply. That's what she was kind of getting at, is that the delaying to implement the Minsk Accords actually did provide Ukraine with some, uh, with some time to prepare to, to face Russia. So that was an interesting statement from Merkel, but I think the re-emergence of Merkel, we're starting to see Merkel make a lot of media appearances now. I don't think that's, uh, that's by chance. I don't think it's Merkel saying, you know, I want to, uh, I want to get some press. 
I want to be in the media because I just want to. You know, she's being uh, put onto the world stage again because I think, number one, she, uh, this is for domestic reasons, because she is seen, I imagine, she's seen in Germany at this moment as, as, a, as a stable, what was a more stable uh, presence in government, given the, the chaos of the current government. She was seen more as a stabilizing force, so they're probably bringing her out to the media to, to bring back those, those warm feelings, reminisce on those feelings of, uh, of stability in Germany. But more importantly, I think she's being brought out because uh, they may be positioning her to, uh, in the future, to contact Putin, to contact the Russians, and to try and figure out a way to, to get out of this Ukraine mess that the EU has gotten itself into. So she may be re-emerging in order to act as some sort of mediator with regards to, uh, to the EU and Russia. And it's not a bad plan, I guess, because if there was anyone that, uh, that understood Putin and could talk to Putin, it was uh, Merkel. And so maybe she's kind of making, uh, or they're putting her out there so that they can try to make moves to, to create some sort of off-ramp and perhaps tie up a, a ceasefire deal, a peace, uh, a peace deal between Russia and Ukraine. So that's Merkel. Let's now shift gears and talk about how, uh, how Ukraine is, uh, is lashing out at Israel now, which is interesting. So you have the uh, Ukrainian ambassador in Israel. And let me pull out my phone here so I can read you his quote. So the Ukrainian ambassador in Israel is very upset with, uh, with the Israelis because the Israelis do not provide these uh, spike anti-tank weapons and they're not giving Ukraine the Iron Dome. They're not giving Ukraine the Iron Dome, of which the Ukrainian ambassador in Israel says, we need the Iron Dome and we will pay for it. We don't just want it as a gift, we'll actually pay for it. Now, the spike um, anti-tank um, weapons, well, those were actually approved by, um, I believe it was the, the German government or the U.S. government. I think it was the German government actually approved the uh, giving the spike um, missiles, the spike weapons to Ukraine, but there was a provision in that contract which said that the supplier Israel can uh, can block the transfer of those uh, of those weapons, and that's what Israel did. And this has the Ukrainians fuming. So, speaking to reporters on Tuesday, Ambassador Yevgeny Kornichuk appealed for step-up military assistance from Israeli governments, criticizing its alleged decision to deny the transfer of Israeli made spike tank guided missiles, spike anti-tank guided missiles. Quote, I want the Israeli government to move away from its comfort zone and to get back to reality. He said, claiming that US officials signed off on the spike missiles, which were to be transferred through Germany. But Israel said no. Okay, so the US signed off on getting these spike anti-tank missiles to Ukraine via Germany and Israel said no. We are going to block this move. Now, the ambassador also said that uh, Ukraine needs the Iron Dome. Quote, we need the Iron Dome, which will allow us to save our, civiliz our civilian women and children from the shelling of the Russian missiles in our territory. I do not want to call this a weapon. I call it protective gear that will protect our civilians. You cannot kill with it. Uh, Kornichuk also claimed that Ukraine would pay for the Iron Dome, saying, we don't need a donation, we want to buy it. I don't know if Ukraine will be paying for it, I think more along the lines of, uh, of the US, or actually the EU, would, uh, <laughs> would be paying for the Iron Dome if, if it were to be given to, uh, to Ukraine. But, you know, Ukraine is like lashing out at everybody. It's not, this, this is a very weird diplomacy, I must admit. A diplomacy by anger, where uh, Ukraine diplomats 
uh, berate and yell at uh, countries from which they're looking for uh, assistance and help. I don't quite understand this, what is it, passive aggressive type of diplomacy, but you know, whatever works. Let's, uh, let's wait and see if Israel does decide to, uh, to remove the block of the delivery of the Spike anti-tank anti missile system. And uh, as far as the Iron Dome, I don't know, this is the first I've heard about the Iron Dome being given to Ukraine. Either way, I don't think these things are simple solutions that can be implemented in, uh, in a couple of days or even in a couple of months. But, you know, weapons, let's just pour more and more weapons into Ukraine. And um, there are actually a lot of authorities now, Interpol and a lot of other authorities, police authorities, that are very wor worried about all these weapons that are being poured into Ukraine. Actually, I believe that authorities in Sweden or EU authorities said that uh, they're worried that these weapons in Sweden will be uh, used by various gangs to cause all kinds of trouble. And so there are a lot of uh, police organizations from Interpol to local police organizations, including ones in uh, Sweden, which are very worried about all of these weapons that have been flooded into Ukraine, because no doubt a lot of these weapons are going to make their way to the black market. And of course, they're going to get into the hands of uh, gangs and criminals. So let's now shift gears and talk about NATO and what NATO said with regards to Finland and Sweden and uh, those countries having nukes on their uh, territory. So the U.S.-led NATO alliance is not inclined to give Russia any security guarantees on the deployment of nuclear weapons on the territories of its two prospective members, Finland and Sweden, according to, De to Deputy Secretary General Camille Brandt. This is what she said. Every country is free in the nuclear field to deploy or not to deploy such weapons. We are not talking about setting up some principal restrictions on the possible actions of the alliance, the NATO official told Swiss broadcaster RTS in an interview published on Tuesday. Every NATO member country decides the issue sovereignly, and now there is no such question, but I do not think that in the current situation, it is necessary to give Russia any guarantees regarding our military posture in the region. Now, I did a video on this. I was actually in Cyprus, in Aya Napa. I remember this video, and I actually said that uh, because it had to do with, I believe the prime minister, of a Finland who gave an interview and said, yes, we're going to enter NATO, but there is no way, no chance that we're going to have any types of, uh, of long range missiles or nukes or anything like that, that are going to be a threat to Russia that can strike Russian territory. And that was um, her guarantee to Russia. That was Finland's guarantee to Russia. You know, my word, you have my word as, uh, as prime minister, we're not going to deploy these types of weapons in Finland. And I remember as I was doing that video, I said, you know, that's all well and good, but what happens with the next administration in Finland, the, the next prime minister or a new prime minister or a new government, what happens if you get a more hawkish government and they decide, you know what, let's, uh, let's put some nukes here. I mean, these aren't really guarantees for, uh, for Russia. And sure enough, you, have, you now have NATO coming out and saying, you know what, um, every country can decide if they want to uh, put nuclear weapons or any types of uh, long-range missiles in their, uh, in their country. We're not going to uh, stop them from doing that. So I am sure that this interview and this response from uh, NATO Deputy Secretary General Camille Grant is going to, to really irk the, uh, the Russians. For this, I have no doubt. And all they're going to say is, uh, let's, let's go this way. All they're going to say is, you see, just three weeks ago, Finland was telling us, you have our word and we're not going to, uh, to deploy weapons um, on our territory, weapons that can strike Russia on our territory, including nuclear missiles. And now you have NATO coming and contradicting the prime minister of Finland. So... Yeah, it's, it, it's, <laughs> this is not going to play well with, uh, with Russia. We have to wait for the vote come the end of uh, June. 
And let's wait for the vote to see if Finland and Sweden even get into NATO because Turkey remains firm. Turkey is uh, staying its ground and they are saying we are not going to vote yes for Finland and Sweden unless we get the, uh, the guarantees and our terms met. PKK, Kurdish, all of these people in, uh, in Finland and Sweden, they have to get extradited and Finland and Sweden have to renounce the, uh, the PKK and uh, the Kurds, the Kurdish Workers' Party as terrorist organizations. Turkey is not budging on this position and they said they will vote no if Finland and Sweden do not agree. But um, if they do manage to get into NATO, it's just the beginning. It's not the end of this story. It is just the beginning because we are going to have all kinds of issues with, uh, with missiles and weapons and the talk about putting nukes in, uh, in Finland and Sweden, that's going to, to really uh, bother the Russians. It's gonna push the Russians to, to take a very aggressive stance towards Finland and Sweden. What that would mean, who knows? In Greece, the, uh, the mopeds, they, they drive on the sidewalks. <laughs> So let's uh, let's do a quick clown world. <laughs> let's do a quick clown world here, and uh, we actually have two clown worlds, kind of two clown worlds. The first clown world has to do with the fact that Ukraine has now um, said that they are going to be banning any types of books, like uh, Tol Tolstoy's War and Peace, any types of books that uh, talk about the Russian military or glorify the Russian military like War and Peace and any other types of uh, classic Russian novels. And I find this really funny because it just shows that you have a Ukraine that just cannot reconcile their history. They can't accept the, the history of who they are or the history of the, of the region and area in general. They haven't been able to reconcile it. And uh, what they try to do is they try to cancel it and they try to erase it. And they believe by erasing War and Peace and Tolstoy novels and any, anything else that's connected to Russia, they believe by erasing these things and banning these things, they, they kind of purify their, their history of any type of, of, uh, of Russian uh, remnants or anything like that. I just find it really funny. It's, I guess you could say that Ukraine is kind of the first real postmodern uh, country, or it's trying to become the first postmodern country because Ukraine is, it doesn't exist without Russia and the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union and all of this history. So it's, how do you erase the very history that has uh, given you your existence? It's very, very odd. But uh, so be it. The real clown world, let's, let's call this the second clown world, but this is the real clown world. And this is a good one. I'm gonna put a photo up here of a painting and it's Boris Johnson. That is Boris Johnson. And uh, recently Boris Johnson was initiated into the Cossacks and given the name Boris Chuprina, which is Ukrainian for, uh, for his locks, for his blonde hair, I guess. And uh, the decision to initiate Boris Johnson was made by the Chernihiv Kozak community. A certificate certifying Boris Johnson as an honorary Kozak will be sent to London. <laughs> so there, there you have the, uh, the painting of uh, Boris Johnson. You can see the, the little trident in the corner as well, or you saw the little trident in the corner. That is a picture of Boris Johnson who is now an honorary <laughs> Kozak, Chernikiv Kozak, I guess. <laughs> um, and the certificate is coming for Boris Johnson. So, you know, not a bad, uh, a bad week for Boris Johnson, I guess. He's, he's on his way out as uh, prime minister of the UK, but uh, at least he's now um, an honorary Kozak, according to, uh, to Ukraine, to the Chernikiv Kozaks. So, you know, you lose one position, you gain another. Let's just uh, call it a wash, Boris Johnson. <laughs> you know, you're even, you're even Steven. 
Anyway, that is the video, guys. The Duran.locals.com. Check out Alexandra's channel and check out all the great analysis that he is doing. Check out the Duran channel and all the great analysis that me and Alexander are doing. And uh, I will sign off from Athens, Greece. Take care.